that's a good font size for everyone. I don't know if you read. All right. Uh, we even work together, and <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, something with the signals. Uh, so I'm going to actually dovetail into a related but kind of different topic, and it may sound scary, or you may be very familiar with it, uh, but it's applicatives and Swift, uh, or you may not need a monad. Uh, so one of the cool things about Swift and uh, functional programming in general is how we can kind of store information in types to form a kind of computational context. Uh, very commonly uh, used version of this idea is the optional type. Uh, the optional encodes like one additional piece of information uh, into the type that it is uh, against, which is whether that uh, value exists or not inside of the context. Uh, so in some kind of non-sugary way, we can kind of look at optional as a type that either has a wrapped value. Oh, I did not. A viewpoint. Yeah. yeah. Please make sure to be recorded. Everything. I have not clicked on. Oh, yeah. Ah, he's Oh, you are recording. You're recording the whole time. No, I just started. Oh, okay. All right. From where we left off. <laughs> um. All right, so optional is really kind of a context. This is my cursor. And it encodes, kind of wraps a value, or doesn't. So this is a, kind of interesting. We get uh, an additional piece of information just by having this wrapper type. And we're used to using these uh, wrappers all the time. Uh, array is another example of uh, a context that adds the idea of uh, a number of uh, wrapped uh, values, or none as well. It kind of fits as an ad hoc uh, uh, optional if you only contain one value in it. Uh, so this brings us to some more words that are good to know, uh, and that is functor. Uh, functor is basically the idea that we can map on a value. So I think most of us are comfortable mapping uh, an array's values into another kind of form. But optional has the exact same stuff built in. We can map and pass it a, uh, a function, which generally, basically, it's lifted into that context of the optional and transforms it into something new. So we can map into the context, transform it, increment it, and we, we get two. The exact same semantics that we get when we map uh, into an array or map over an array. Uh, so. Because of this additional context, we get some additional interesting behavior. We can map on a none, and you know it's similar to the optional bind we're used to. It just doesn't do anything. There's no uh, value to change. Uh, and so this is interesting. It's this pure function. Uh, whenever you see map, you can kind of assume or hope that the computation that happens inside is pure. And uh, it also is kind of uh, closed. I don't know if it's mathematically closed, maybe closed functor. I don't know. Still learning this stuff. Uh, but the idea is within the, that operation, the map operation, uh, there is no information about the context itself. There's no ability to transform a sum into a none. Uh, that just can't happen. Uh, but that's where another good word to know comes in, and that is uh, the monad. So uh, monad is a, a structure that is a bit stricter than a functor. Same way that you were seeing kind of the, the bubbling out structure in uh, Brandon number one's talk. Uh, you, you can consider a, uh, a monad as a more constrained functor. Every monad induces functor. Every monad is a functor. Uh, and it means that we have this flat map operation. 
And flat map also lets us kind of uh, take the value of the current context, and it, it gives us this striking ability to actually change the context itself. We can reflect on the value that we have and decide to, to fail over. We, we can have an effectful computation. We can say that if uh, it's an even number, we want to return none. Uh, otherwise, we can just kind of pass it through. It's very similar to like a filter. Um, I feel like I'm in the wrong X code. Ah, it's the reverse mistake. <laughs> The dual of mistake. Uh, so there we go. It fails over to nil. Uh, if I get rid of the increment, it becomes an operation that doesn't fail, and we get one. Uh, so that's pretty cool. I mean, uh, it's kind of stuff that we use every day and don't realize. Uh, a lot of the optional sugar that we use with guardlet, if let. Uh, especially when you are binding on multiple values at once, uh, is really just this in disguise. So there's actually a category in between, um, and that's the topic uh, of today, which is uh, the applicative. And uh, applicative is something that doesn't have the same semantics as monad but it gives us a little bit more than the map operation. Uh, so let's kind of define what that looks like. Uh, you all like operators? All right. So this, does this have a name, star? Uh, just like with map and with flat map, what we want is a function and a, a, a value to basically pipe through it. Uh, in the case of um, a functor, we pass a pure function. But in the case of a, an applicative, we pass in an f that is basically already wrapped. And then we pass the value so that we can produce uh, the computation, or in this case, with the optional not. So, we can use our bind syntax. And if either of those is nil, we can return nil. Extra. I swear these errors were showing up before. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Well, technically, it should still compile. Uh, that should be defined in my source. Uh, it's actually the generics. Everyone's free to help. It's a, a group project. So Xcode seems happy. Uh, how can we kind of work with this? Well, uh, to make applicative really work, we'd need one more function. And that's a function called pure. And it is available to lift a value into our type. And this is an easy one. We can be explicit about it, though. Still seems happy. So now that we have this, we could, uh, let's just define uh, probably the simplest thing we can do within Swift, which is uh, lift. We like adding numbers today. Going to continue. And we're going to pass it the arguments that it expects. And technically, we want this to be pure as well, but Swift 
automatically uh, wraps optionals for us. So that's pretty cool. We could also uh, allow this to fail. Got none. So this differs from what we had with math. We can actually use the fact that we have lifted the function using pure into an optional uh, to allow it to fail along the way. Uh, apply itself kind of is aware of the different, uh, basically the left hand and right hand sides of its context. The context themselves can uh, basically start encoding information. In this case, we can encode failability using optional. So, uh, we start to notice something here about the structure of these uh, functions. And it ends up kind of looking like this. Uh, map ends up taking a, a pure A to B, taking an optional A, returning an optional B. Uh, apply takes an optional A to B, an optional A, and returns an optional B. And flat map return, takes an uh, an A to optional B that is not optional, and then ends up taking an optional A to optional B. So, this example with the tuple is not quite as interesting because we're only dealing with two structures, and apply allows us to kind of continue to go along. So, what we can do is we can uh, curry our function. So let's define add as a function that takes an int and returns a function that takes an int to finally return an int. And that is going to look nested like this. With another int, another friend. With that, we can actually lift, add, apply a pure one, apply a pure two. And I feel like maybe you're having a similar response to the beginning of some of the, the talks you've just seen. Like, why does this matter? Uh, is it, why is this interesting? Um, and for optional, maybe it's not. Uh, maybe it just reads left to right. Um, but if we actually go back to how we define this, uh, there's a structure kind of lurking beneath that we were talking about. Uh, we can just do the uh, monad induced version of apply. So we want to return f flat math to extract the f. And then we can merely math on x call f of x. And it still works. So we've kind of generalized this. Uh, we're no longer dependent on the sugar that SWIFT gives us, and we can apply this to unique types that we own. Uh, so in this case, let's say we are using this as a failable operation, right? Like switching this to nil will fail across the board. We could apply this to maybe a more real world use case. So we can create maybe a user struct that has an ID that's required, an email. And we are going to go back and create another curried kind of initializer. All right, so this is maybe looking tedious at this point. We can lift create user uh, and then apply first a number and then an email. And we end up with, a, with an optional user. Um, so this is kind of neat. We have all these requirements, but within the, this new kind of structure, uh, we can tease out new kinds of behaviors. So again, like, 
If any of these aren't passed, we get a failable initializer for free. We didn't have to do init question mark. We can just rely on the fact that these are required. Um, and so what's like another uh, example of failability? Well, maybe we want to create some validation functions. So id is an int, and we're just going to fail over if it's not a good structure. So let's basically require that an id is greater than zero, and we can return pure id. Otherwise, we can return none. And I'll copy paste to email string. At this point, we can ah, this should account for all cases. <laughs> so now we can use our validator functions. We can kind of validate uh, that the ID is right, and we can validate that the email is correct. And we're we're kind of slowly uh, taking small components. Um, is this actually erring or not? I can't tell. Seems to work. Yeah. I'll follow radar. Uh, but we're kind of getting the default Swift behavior, where when something fails, we just return nil. Uh, and we are used to working with some uh, structures that hit encode even more information. So it all goes back to using our, our data structures to kind of build information on top of kind of more basic uh, contexts. So one that we are used to using, I'll add it up here, is the result type or either type. So let's encode a result that either has an error or a value. And it will have two cases. We'll have a success of A or a failure of B. E. So now, uh, result is a functor. So let's define map on it. We want to map our A to B. Map, remember, takes an F from A to B. And this time, we want to return a result of B. So we turn to switching against self. Never live code. So we can case let find on success, in which case uh, we have an X that we can uh, rewrap in a success of F of X. And we have a case of failure where we just want to rewrap that failure in the new type. And we want to return it. All right, uh, this result is also typically a monad. And we can create that structure pretty quickly uh, via copy-paste. Uh, this time, flat map needs to return, uh, the function needs to actually return a wrapped result uh, of the error. And this time, we just need to get rid of that success, because now we have the uh, ability to change that shape of the context. We can go from a successful result to a failure, depending on this operation. 
All right. So I think we basically have all of the tools that we need to induce the applicative. So first we need pure to return a result. I'm going to have to add my E over there. But we can return a success. And we can define our friendly operator. Uh, actually, I think I can just copy and paste that from above and change the types. This is a uh, generic structure just working for us. So you need here a result of uh, again, need to add E to our list. A result of the function and a result of the first argument, the argument to the function. And finally, return a result of B. And it, yeah, great. So all we have to do now is encode the failure into our validations. So we start by changing our optional to a result. Let's just use a string as our error message. And again, results were string our error message. And we just need to encode our failure. Uh, And some of us may be used to using the result type to do this kind of thing. And if you notice, we, we already get a change in this structure here. You can print it out below again. Uh, basically, we get a re result of success when everything is valid. Uh, if we drop the at sign, we should get failure, the invalid email. Uh, and if we try to do some kind of um, negative number, uh, we'll get invalid ID. Pretty cool. We're using the exact same structure. Like, nothing actually changed on this line between the optional version and the result version. It just, just kind of works now. Um, but you may notice something strange. Uh, we have an invalid email, but we're not actually capturing that. And if you've ever dealt with any kind of like form with a bunch of data, uh, failing out on the first error is not always the friendliest experience. It's not really what we want. Uh, but we can't actually do anything differently with a monad because monad hits failure and it just keeps passing that failure down. Uh, so it sounds like in this case, we just don't want a monad. Don't reach for a tool that doesn't help you out. Uh, but of course, that makes apply fail. So let's change what apply looks like. Uh, because we have both the structure of the F and the X, we can actually do case analysis against them. And on the case where we have a We have a success of F, and just anything. Uh, we can use the functor uh, to map the F into it. On the case of uh, invalid, it's actually another mathy term. Uh, and let's say valid failure. Ah. So let's do failure and success. And we just want to return at failure. And in the 
final case, we can preserve the original functionality by just you know, caring that it's a failure. And all right. Uh, but we already have more power here, right? We could actually flip this. We could change the behavior to return the last failure only. Like, we could not have done this with a monad. We would not have been able to keep track of the context across uh, steps. Uh, so this is where semi-groups come in. So we want to accumulate our errors, uh, which means if we limit our applicative against semi-group and unwrap both of them, we can wrap our next failure. Where at? Oh, here we go. With the accumulation. And so that, of course, uh, breaks our validate function. It's not because uh, string is not a semi group, but because I didn't conform it to it. But we can change our errors to actually accumulate an array of errors now. And really, all we have to do here is modify the structure extremely slightly. And look at that. So result type is typically monadic, uh, but a lot of languages encode a, a separate type uh, in the applicative to do this. And it's usually called validation. It's why my muscle memory is going for validation. Uh, but that's a very common example of the benefits of kind of not going as far as a monad and going to this, this cool structure in between that I don't think we really think about often enough. Uh, and because it is so generalized, again, using any semi-group, you could build up maybe a, a dictionary of uh, keyed errors against arrays of errors. Uh, and again, the actual functions that need to change are the validation functions, nothing else. So I want to explore one other uh, kind of real-world uh, benefit of thinking in the terms of applicative. And that is uh, the idea of futures. Uh, does everyone know generally what a future is? Basically, it holds on to a computation. We'll call it f because that is what we name every function in this. Uh, and so that computation is just going to be kind of a to void to void. And that way, it can hold on to the, the first half of this. Um, now we just need an initializer. Can copy paste. Escaping. Always be escaping. All right, we have this future. Uh, we could instantiate one right now. Um, a future where we have this callback and we can pass it a value. But it doesn't really. So this wraps up a computation. Uh, we can kind of pass it around, uh, and we can fetch the value when we need it. So let's define a typical uh, function to do that. We want on results a callback, which kind of looks like that inner wraps function. And we can basically just call self.f with the callback. I'm also going to comment this out. So now we can call on results uh, and just print the value.
and we get it below. So you may have guessed by now that future is a functor. So we need to map the A to the B. We have an F from A to B. And we want to return a future of B. Now how do we do this? Well, we know we need to return a future of B, which means using return. We know that a future takes a callback. And we have the current context of the current future, so we can call on results, which returns the x. And again, this, it all looks the same after a while. And we probably need to escape. probably need to escape. Uh, I mean, probably. Where? Line 144. Oh, yeah, let's do a G. <laughs> and now our G looks... I'm going to get out of completion. All right, now we, we need to do that mapping that we keep doing. So G goes from A to B, and X is an A. So we can use that to transform it into an, uh, a B, or an A, rather, and finally pass it down. And I am missing something. And another escaping. This just saves work for later. So, ah, ah. Hope I'm throwing you back to your Swift 1.2 days there. <laughs> and what else? Ah. <laughs> One more, I swear. There are probably more than need be, but. We, we got there. All right. So now that we have map, now that we got there, we can go back to our old friend, addition, and we can do this very complex computation to print out the new value. So again, just composition, good stuff. So future can also, and, and typically is, uh, a monad. So let's kind of copy and paste and tease out the difference in the structure again. In this case, uh, our A should go to f uh, future B, which means that once we are in here, uh, our G actually takes the A. And now we can just kind of call on result the uh, pass F through. I think that's right. Seems happy. Oh. How does it know? The types. So we also rename that to file map, and that's pretty great. So let's kind of think about uh, what futures usually mean. And it usually means that we have like some kind of asynchronous uh, situation, maybe a network request, uh, maybe, maybe we do a, a thread for a long-running computation. Um, so let's kind of, well, stepping back, getting, getting too far ahead, let's induce applicative. You should be used to that by now. And it's even easier this time. Go back to our optional situation. Canes coming from the side. So we 
want A to be where we wrap our function in the future. And we want it to take future and a future to be returned. Yeah. And then pure looks a lot like what we have down here. We just need to change it to return a future. And a future of A. Even go back to the old structure. Let me just silence some ambiguity up here. All right, seems to be working, uh, but let's use our old structure uh, where we do a pure add. And we have a pure one, pure two. Don't bother with the map. And we get three, what we expect. And this is, again, the exact same structure as earlier in the talk. Like, we don't need to do anything other than know what the context is to start benefiting from this line of code. Uh, so let's start talking about that asynchronous uh, part of the equation, where uh, a future may thread out and run for a while. I'm going to create another version of pure and just call it delayed. It's going to basically look the same, but we want to kind of keep track. Let's print delaying. Let's use our friend dispatch main async. And let's say this takes about a second before finally calling. Let's lift our numbers using delay. Uh, I think it's there. I think I need to import that. All right, so let me just add one more print to kind of like demonstrate what's going on here. We have these two pieces that are independent, and yet because we use the monad version of apply, we have this kind of blocking nature. We have, these two requests could have been made in parallel, so why aren't they? Well, we're going to have to go back and demote our future. This flat map just wasn't the right structure. So what do we fill in here? Uh, within the idea of uh, applicatives is just that idea of independent things that you bring into a single context. And we have another function that we use on a rail not all the time, maybe I use it more often than most, called zip. And zip will zip an A and a B into a single context. So we could do a future A, a future B, and produce a future of both A and B. And again, we start off by turning 
that future with the pair of values. Takes a callback. And we have these two futures, and they really only have like map and on result. And so we need to use on result to get to both this A and this B, but there's no way for us to have it at the same time right now. Uh, but future as a construct gives us the ability to do something interesting, which is maybe caching our result and defaulting it to be optional. So now, on results, we want to grab our x, cache it, and then send it to our callback. Now that we are caching it and can kind of reach in and grab it if it exists, our on result is a matter of Uh, basically, if let unwrapping. We can pass the x. Oops, we have our x. We want to reach into our y. And then we can pass them both along. And then the other line looks similar. Just need to switch our pairs. And I think it's happy enough. We just need to swap out our implementation of apply. So we can now zip our f and our x, then map into it, take the f and the x and then apply it. And we get concurrency for free. <laughs> now, of course, you would want to spend more time and make sure everything is thread safe and locked and, and whatnot, but it's pretty incredible that we can simplify the structure of something and, and reach lower and unlock like different possibilities. Oh, that's the result. I'm only printing on the results. Let's combine it with that. Yeah, the print is happening at the very end. I think it, for me, it's come with like a lot of experimentation with how we want to solve the problem and, and get the value out of it. The, the first few times I encountered a plicative, it was always just like, oh, you have a monad, so you also have a plicative, and the value wasn't apparent to me. Uh, but looking at these like things where you have uh, just independent structures that you want to lift into a computation, that's when it sounds like you don't want a monad. Like a monad is usually there for sequential things that you want to be able to have an effect on. So the ability to transform like an optional value into nothing uh, is something that is sequential. You want to be able to take the last value and do something with that. Whereas this, you don't really have, you have more of a bird's eye view than like a kind of intense like path. Thank you.